Let's join together in singing All Hail King Jesus. together with us now and singing nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me Happy Easter. This is uh, Matthew McKellie, the associate pastor here, and I'm wearing disciple and where I teach the kids. So today we're going to do, a, not, not going to do kids corner because we want to do something a little bit special because we're doing Easter. Now this isn't what we wanted to do this week. We wanted to have it at a drive through service, but because of the rain forecast, we're going to go ahead and do this. But I think we have a decent lesson for the kids. So I'm going to engage with the kids and we're going to talk about the Easter story. So listen up. Okay, what are we getting ready to celebrate? <coughs> Okay, what is Easter all about? It's about God's birth. Um, mm-hmm. and God risen from the grave. God risen from the grave, that's right. 
So <clears throat> what happened on, on Friday when, when Jesus was going on? What happened on Friday? What, was, what happened to Jesus? He died on the cross. How did they do that? They nailed him onto the cross. Okay. Now, where did they place Jesus afterwards? In a tomb. In a tomb. Do you remember whose tomb it was? Remember, it was Joseph of Arimathea. It was his tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. All right. So we're going to look at this little example. Okay. So we have. I'm going to show you guys. Show the camera. We have five eggs, two purple, a pink, a yellow, and a gold. Right. You guys see all that? Okay, now we're going to talk about the representation of what happened when Christ went into the tomb. Okay, so in each of these, which I'll give you at the end, what's in that? It's candy, so that's the pink. What's this? You're the candy, right? Another candy, that's right. We hear the candy? We hear that? Okay, so all five of these have candy, right? Now what does the candy represent? Jesus in the tomb, right? <clears throat> Jesus in the tomb. Now, what happened on the third day? He rose from the dead. Now, what happened? When Mary and them wanted to go check the tomb. He wasn't there. He wasn't there, right? Where was he? He rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. So we're going to take the Easter color, right? Easter yellow, that's right. Now, what happened? He what? What was up with the tomb? Eyes open. When they went inside of it, what was in it? Nothing. Nothing. Just like inside of the Easter yellow egg. egg. He wasn't in the tomb. Now, isn't that cool to think about how God sent his son to what? To die for us, right? To die for the world because he loved the world so much. And Jesus loved the world so much that he obeyed the Father, and came down. And on Easter, we see that he died on, on Friday, buried, and then on Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. Isn't that pretty neat? Yeah. And that's why we celebrate Easter. Yeah. Now this week, we have to do it here, don't we? We have to do it like this. We, we can't have church, right? Because some stupid, what's it called? Coronavirus. Because of a stupid coronavirus. But who's bigger than the coronavirus? God, God is. That's right. He beat it all, didn't he, when he took the grave, right? So what I want you guys to remember, you kiddos remember too, that Easter's more than just candy. Easter's more than just being with family. Easter's about God goes from the dead. that empty tomb. So you guys have a good Easter, and remember what Easter's all about. It's not about the bunny. It's not about all the different things. It's about our Lord and how he was representation in that empty tomb. You guys have an awesome Easter. Christ arose, probably one of the most traditional Easter hymns in our book.
as we prepare to hear from the word of God on this Easter, let's join in Christ alone.
Well, I hope you have a blessed Easter today as we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, right? I, and, I, and I hope uh, that today that you feel and that you sense and that you know who Jesus is today and that you embrace him fully, right, and, and, and rejoice in his resurrection. Uh, before we get into the word of God this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you and we give you thanks, God, for who you are and uh, that you loved this world, God, enough to send your son Jesus um, to, to take our punishment, uh, to take uh, all of our sin upon himself and f- for us uh, as our substitution. And so, God, we praise you and we give you thanks for that. And as we dive into your word this morning, Father, I pray that it would bless hearts, that uh, if there would be somebody that was watching today that doesn't have the assurance uh, of your salvation, Father, would today be the day uh, that they can rejoice and know that, uh, that, that heaven is their home and that Jesus is their Savior and that they have been forgiven. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So there are a lot of things that uh, people get just really uptight about, right? I mean, so there are so many things that people believe to be true and untrue, and so basically they invest their lives into those things really when they, they have little bearing on life. Uh, for example, uh, perhaps you believe in global warming, Right now, you can believe that the ice caps are melting and that the ocean levels are rising. Right, and maybe you don't believe that. Uh, maybe you say that that's just a normal cycle of climate change. Right, uh, if you do believe in global warming, you, probably you're very intent on recycling and and buying products that use less energy. Right, you uh, you get rid of your SUV and you go buy the hybrid. Th- those are the things that you do if you believe in global warming. Now, if you don't believe in global warming, you get in your SUV that guzzles gasoline and you drive to Wisconsin and you eat cheese made from cows that emit methane, right? What about your particular brand of politics? Listen, there is nothing in the United States that is quite as decisive as politics. I mean, you either love President Trump or you can't stand him, right? Uh, some of you that are watching, uh, you cannot wait to go cast your vote for uh, President Trump later on this year. Then there are others of you who are watching and you are just marking your calendars for the day that he is no longer our president, right? Um, now, let, let me just say this. This is kind of a side note and then we're going to move on, right? If we Christians were to invest the same amount of energy and time in sharing the gospel that we campaign for politics, our world would be different, right? Because listen, the gospel is what saves people. The gospel is what's going to change things. Not a political person, not a political party, right? Okay. We're going to move on from that topic. Here's the point that I'm trying to make. There is so much that has little bearing on our life right now. There are so many things that we believe to be true or untrue that really have no impact on the way that we live whatsoever. This morning, I want you to see that Jesus Christ has bearing on everything, right? How you respond to Jesus is the most important decision that you will ever make in your life, right? What you believe about his message is of utmost importance. What you believe about the resurrection is life critical, right? And this is what Jesus is gonna go after in our text this morning. So our our text, Matthew chapter 12, uh, a couple of years before his death, Jesus warned a group of people about the very issue of what they do with him. What you do with me is life critical, is basically Jesus' message here. And, And today, we are warned right here and now to think about what we are doing with Jesus. Jesus is asking, what? What are you doing with me? Jesus is asking, what are you doing with my resurrection? And can I tell you something? Your response is a big deal. 
And listen, what you choose to believe about global warming or politics or anything else, uh, while you may believe it is tremendously huge, it is small in comparison to what you believe about Jesus, right? What you truly believe about Jesus is life critical. Your entire eternity hinges on what you believe about Jesus. And so if you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, uh, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. If you don't have your Bible right now, you could just pause the video, and you can go grab it, and then come back, hit unpause, and uh, we're right on the same page, right? Now, before we get to our text, let's just get a little backstory real quick. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, Jesus has started his ministry. He's been healing people. He's been calming storms, right? He's been confronting the religious pious. Uh, he is teaching doctrine. He's healing the blind. He's casting out demons, all of this stuff, right? And, and one of those moments where he is casting out a demon is kind of a critical moment in our text this morning. It's, it sets the stage age for what we're going to look at. There's a, uh, there's a blind and mute man. He is demon-possessed, and, and people, uh, there's some people that bring this man to Jesus so he can be healed, and Jesus heals him. This man can now see, he can now talk, and, and the demon has been cast out, right? Now, of course, the crowd is absolutely amazed by this, and, and, and they begin thinking, okay, Jesus could be the Messiah, right? But there are some Pharisees that, that hear about this, and they begin to spout off, right? And, and, and check out the audacity of what they say. Uh, they say that Jesus is doing this by the power of Beelzebub, right? The prince of demons. And, and so Jesus takes this opportunity to teach him a little bit. And he says, listen, how, how can I use the power of a demon to cast out a demon, right? A, a house that stands against itself is not going to stand. And so he confronts their wicked unbelief. Uh, he, he confronts them. He pins them up against the wall, and he shows them the truth. But, of course, they don't listen, right? Right? And it is this kind of, uh, uh, it's this showdown at the Galilee Corral, right? This is the setting uh, of where the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they ask Jesus for something that they don't really want, and in response, they hear something that they'd rather not hear, right? They ask for a sign, and Jesus gives them a warning. You see, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law, they are playing the deadly game. They had already begun their plot to kill Jesus. And they were, gonna, they were trying to trap him in his own words. And so let's look at it together in Matthew chapter 12. Uh, let's begin with verse number 38. It says, Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, teacher, we want a miraculous sign, right? They, they asked for something that they didn't really want, and, and you would expect Jesus to say, hey, guys, haven't you seen the miracles that I've been performing, right? Uh, don't you remember the time that I turned water into wine? Uh, did you forget about the man that had leprosy that I healed? Uh, did you forget about Peter's mother-in-law, right? What about the dead girl that I raised to life, right? Didn't, didn't you notice the man that had a shriveled up hand and I, and I healed him? Have you already forgotten that? What about, what about the man that I just healed a few moments ago? We would expect Jesus to say something like that, but he doesn't. Instead, he cuts right to the heart, and he, he goes right after their unbelief, and he calls them a wicked and adulterous generation. Because here's the deal. Their request was firmly rooted in the concrete of unbelief, right? They were playing a game with Jesus, and so the sign that they want is not the sign that they get. The sign that they get is the sign of Jonah. 
And so he reminds them of Jonah, and he says, you know, just like Jonah, who was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, right? Now, on the surface, it looks like Jesus is just kind of a foretelling of his resurrection, right? What we're celebrating today on Easter. He's foretelling of his resurrection. But here's the deal. He, he is doing that, but what he's saying is so much more than that, right? He is setting the stage for this warning that he's going to give on this adulterous group of people, like this, right, this group that has, uh, that has rejected him. And so look at verse 41 and 42 with me. It says, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and they will condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, but now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus says, listen, these outsiders are going to condemn you. And he reminds them of two moments in Israel's history, right? The first one is Jonah. You remember Jonah's story, right? He was called by God to go to Nineveh. He was supposed to go there and tell them to repent and to follow the one true living God. Now, what did Jonah do? He went the opposite direction, right? He's uh, he, he got on a boat, sailed in the opposite direction. He's now out in the middle of the, of the sea. A major storm comes along. The, the crew members are just uh, flabbergasted by this sudden storm. They're trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Jonah, who is in kind of the, the bottom of the ship and he is asleep, he, he gets up, he comes up to the top of the boat and he says, you know what? This is all about me, guys. And so... What do the crew members do? They throw Jonah overboard. The storm stops. A big fish comes up, swallows Jonah, and he is in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. Right? So after those three days, Jonah finally comes to the end of himself, right? He repents, and he says, okay, God, listen, I agree with you. I'll go to Nineveh. And so the fish spits him out. Jonah goes to Nineveh. He tells the Ninevites that they need to repent. And if they don't, in 40 days, God is going to destroy him. Nineveh says, okay. And so they repent. And so Jonah, this grumpy, reluctant prophet, goes to a place that he doesn't want to go. He preaches the truth. And the pagans in Nineveh believe. That's the first moment that he reminds them of. The second moment, probably a moment that is a little less known, uh, but uh, he he says the queen of the south, right? That is another piece of history that we learn about in in the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 10, actually. The queen of the south, she travels from a long distance. We think she's from Ethiopia, but she travels a long distance to get to Jerusalem because she hears about the great wisdom and the great wealth of Solomon. And so she travels with this grand caravan to see Solomon. She meets with him, and the Bible says that she asks some very hard questions of Solomon. And Solomon answers her. And you know what happens? The Bible says that she puts her faith and trust in God. She believes. Listen to what it says in 1 Kings chapter 10. It says, uh, Praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. And so Jesus and first kings here, he, they, they make the point of zeroing in on this idea that she traveled from a great distance to hear wisdom from Solomon, and as a result of hearing that wisdom, she believes. She heard about it, she traveled a great distance, she listened to Solomon, she believed, and she praised God. Now, Jesus is saying this, if the Ninevites... And some queen from the south comes to belief in God with 
by the way, with very little revelation, with less truth than you are getting now, right? He says, then listen, then you will be condemned. And the key words are right there in the text. It says, and now something greater than Jonah is here. And now something greater than Solomon is here. Nineveh believed Jonah. The queen believed Solomon. But now something greater than either one of them was here in their midst teaching them. Jesus was saying to these unbelievers, you've got me. You've got my message. The kingdom of God is with you now. And here, a little, in a little while, you're going to have my resurrection. But you don't believe. And listen, because you have hardened your heart in unbelief, the Ninevites and the Queen of the South, they are going to rise up at judgment. They're going to point the finger at you, and they are going to condemn you. The Ninevites were going to say, all we had was a grumpy old prophet who didn't even really care about us. And we believed. You had Jesus. Why didn't you believe? And the queen of the south is going to stand up and she's going to say, I believed simply because I seen how God had blessed Solomon. You had Jesus. Why didn't you believe? And so here's the point. What we do with Jesus, what we do with his cross, what we do with his resurrection, what we do with his word, those are the weightiest issues of life. Those are the weightiest issues of eternity. Now, look at what Paul wrote to the first Corinthians, uh, to the Corinthians and in first Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says this, he says, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word that I have preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Listen, right, this is so important. We have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We have the resurrection. We have numerous eyewitness accounts that have been recorded for us. We we have the word of God. We have the testimony of the church throughout the ages. We have clearly seen God's uh, created order and it, that is all around us. We have the gospel. The believers from Nineveh will rise up on the day of the judgment and they will condemn the people that Jesus was talking to who refused to repent and believe. The queen of the south will rise up and stand and point a finger at those Pharisees and those religious pious people and say that you had something greater than Solomon. And so here's the question. Will they also stand up? And condemn you. Listen, what you do with Jesus right now determines what is going to happen to you at the judgment, right? There, there's been this question that has been asked throughout the ages. I have been asked this question so many times. How could a loving God send someone to hell? Well, listen, make no mistake about it. You determine your eternity. You will stand before Jesus one day and you will listen. You will hear either those words come into my peace or depart from me, right? And it's all based on the decision that you make. 
I want you to listen to these words from the book of Revelation. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place from them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, believe and repent is such an easy concept, but such a hard thing to do, right? We have so many things that we hold on to as so important, right? Uh, There's a bonus passage for us in this text this morning. There's this other little moment where Jesus confronts the Pharisees and he confronts the teachers of the law and their outright rejection of him, their outright rejection of the truth, and he confronts those uh, also that may just be flirting with the idea of Jesus, right? Those who, those who were after superficial repentance. So I want you to look at that with me. It, it's uh, Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse number 43. These final words warn us against superficial repentance. Look at verse 43. It says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I will turn, return to the house that I left. And when it arrives, it finds, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go and they live in there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. Jesus says in those words, don't flirt with me, right? Don't don't play games with me. He he uses this example of a spirit that's being taken out of a person and it goes away and the person's life is cleaned up a little bit, it is swept up, it is put in order, Uh, the corners are swept clean, but then the spirit comes back and it finds the room unoccupied and it moves back in and that person is worse off than before. Can I tell you something? Flirting with Jesus is just as bad as rejecting him. Let me just say this, right? Jesus is not your hired maid who comes in and sweeps up your life and makes it easier and nicer and prettier and happier. Can I tell you something? Jesus wants the title and deed to your house. He's not your maid. He wants to own your house. There was a song a few years ago, right? Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus doesn't want to take the wheel. He wants the deed. He wants the title to your car. He wants your pink slip. Listen, Jesus wants full surrender. He wants every nook and every cranny of your life. He wants more than just the occasional Sunday. He wants your life and everything in it. He wants authority over your relationships, over your work, over your fun. He wants authority over your spending money and your savings accounts. He wants authority over your emotions, your desires, your time, your heart, your passions, your obedience, and he wants your thoughts. He wants unconditional, unreserved, and unqualified, wholehearted surrender. He wants a life that says, I'm going to abandon my pride, and I'm going to abandon my life for Jesus. He wants to be your greatest treasure. And so Jesus clearly speaks. There, There are two kinds of people watching this message right now. There are those of you who have come to full surrender in Jesus, right? And to you, I want to say, listen, be comforted, 
right? Rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus because you are not condemned. The Bible says that for those in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation, right? Praise God Almighty, we are not condemned because of what Jesus has done. But there's another kind of person that is watching this. And perhaps you have rejected Jesus outright. And perhaps for a few years now, you've just kind of been flirting with the idea of whether or not you should follow Jesus. And it's not wholehearted surrender. My encouragement to you this morning is to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit, right? And embrace Jesus as your Lord. Capital L, Lord. Come to full surrender with Jesus right now. Right? And we do that by repenting. By, by believing in Jesus Christ and repenting. Repenting is agreeing with God that he is right. Right? It, it is turning from our lives and turning towards him. I want to encourage you to do that today to the best of your knowledge to the best of your know-how. Turn to Jesus in repentance. Everything in your life, just turn from that and begin going his way. I'm gonna tell you that I am always available. Uh, If you ever have a question, you wanna know how to come to faith in Jesus Christ. You wanna know how to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ please contact me. You can contact me via our website, via Facebook, uh, but contact me. I I will talk to you over the phone. I will help you. I will pray with you. Um, I want to see you come to Jesus Christ, but it is your decision. You don't have to be in a church building. You can be right there in your living room or in your bedroom or wherever you are watching this. I'm going to lead a prayer at this time. And if you say this prayer, not, and it's not the words that I say that matter. It's what you feel in your heart. But if you pray something like this in your heart and you truly mean it, then the Bible says that at that point, um, you've come to faith in Jesus Christ. Let me pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I admit that I am a sinner, that I have been uh, concerned about me, I've been concerned about my life and what I want. I I have pride in my life, and I have all, all kinds of other things that are in disobedience to you. I admit that I am a sinner. But Father, at this moment, I want to put my faith and trust in you. All those ways that I live and in, in where I am chasing my own things. Father, I repent of those things. I'm going to turn and I'm going to go the other way and I am going to follow after you. I'm going to chase after you, God, and from this moment on. Father, please be the Lord of my life. Would you mold me into the image of Jesus? Would you help me to care about the things that you care about? Would you help me to walk in obedience to you and to your scripture? And Father, help me to find a church that seeks after you as a collective. And Father, may I ground myself with your people and become part of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
Special occasions are often uh, connected with food. Uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, birthdays, things like that. Uh, and perhaps you remember a time where, uh, you know, maybe mom or your wife or somebody was in the kitchen and they were cooking all day long and uh, that smell was just coming out of the kitchen and you, you smell it all day long and you, you smelled and it smelled so good you could almost taste it, right? Um, whenever there's a special meal like that, we can't wait to hear those words come to the table. Well, today, Jesus has set the table and is inviting us to come and dine with him. But listen, there are several things that we need to do to prepare ourselves before we come to the table of God. Uh, first, uh, anytime we sit down for a meal, uh, before we sit down, we need clean hands. Uh, you, you don't go work in the garage or go work in the garden and then come inside, sit down, and just start eating, right? You wash up first. Uh, this is why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians to examine ourselves, to examine our lives before we receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, we may see something that needs to be confessed and cleaned up in our lives. Uh, when we come to Jesus in repentance, Listen, we find forgiveness, we find restoration, and we find that invitation to come and dine with him at his table. Um, there are some people, and they get so burdened by their sin that instead of just uh, coming to God in repentance, they figure that they're too unworthy to participate, and so they pass on partaking in communion. But can I tell you something? None of us are worthy on our own right? None of us are worthy on our own. But if we have trusted Christ, listen, we are eligible. We may not be worthy, but we are eligible because Jesus Christ, who lives inside of us, is worthy. And so he invites us and authorizes us to come to his table. Second thing, uh, before all, the other thing that we need to do before dining, uh, we need a good appetite, right? What would happen if, if you were invited to somebody's house for a dinner and, and an hour before the meal you ate a bag of chips and, you know, drank a Coke and had a box of Twinkies, right? After all of that junk food, you'd have very little appetite for the good stuff. Paul tells us, again in 1 Corinthians, he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. Right? You can't have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Uh, God offers us a substantive meal. Uh, the, bread, the bread and the cup is not going to fill us f physically. Right? It's not going to fill our physical hunger, but it will satisfy our spiritual hunger. When we stuff ourselves with the junk food of sin and of this world, we lose our appetite for the banquet that God has prepared for us. We need to taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Uh, when our perspective is fixed on temporal things, we can get caught up in things that have no lasting value. Jesus promises us, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And then third, we need harmony at the table. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever had a uh, family dinner where you, you all sit down and then all of a sudden something controversial gets brought up, something like uh, politics or something like that, and you, not everybody shares the same viewpoint, and it just kind of ruins the whole meal, right? It, it ruins the whole table experience. Harmony is important in the kingdom of God. Now, we can't expect our entire congregation, we can't expect uh, the church at large to agree on every issue, but we are expected to have unity in Christ, right? Uh, in, in, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, Paul makes a point of saying that we are one body and we partake of one loaf, right? Conflict, tension, disharmony, they can all ruin a perfectly good meal. One thing that we do not bring to God's table is divisiveness. The Bible says that if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember there that your brother has something against you, that you are to leave your gift there, you are to go and be reconciled to your brother, 
and then come back. Right? We come to God's table in harmony with each other as much as it depends on us. So the Apostle Paul tells us of the institution of the Lord's Supper. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And at this time, I'm going to ask Brother Daryl, if he would, to bless the bread. Almost gracious and heavenly Father. Father, we come to you today with thanksgiving in our hearts for the knowing that Christ suffered and died. And Father, as we participate in this day of celebration, Father, we take this bread into our bodies as a symbol of Jesus Christ's body. Today, Father, we humble ourselves. Father, we ask that you bless the bread, you bless this church body. Again, Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your Son. Father, we know that all healing and all power comes from you. So today, Lord, we talk to you and as if you were standing right here with us. Father, we love you and we lift our voice in praise. We thank you, Father, for this bread. We thank you for the communion. Again, Lord, we thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And at this time, I'm going to ask Brother Gary, if he would, to bless the cup. Heavenly Father, we praise you again for the very privilege of standing at this table and in this place to remember what you have done for us. And Father, as we take this, uh, this cup, this symbol of your blood, help us, Lord, to have even a deeper understanding of what it is that we're doing. And let us honor you with our hearts and our lives through the coming days. And let us, Father, be what we need to be, showing grace to others as you showed your grace and mercy on the cross as you died for us. We praise you, dear Lord, for the goodness that you've sent our way in the form of the people that worship with us and in the form of the family of God that we're able to, to gather with. And Father, just help and bless that we could show forth the mercy that you've shown to us, and that, Father, we could be worthy in the sense of accepting Jesus Christ in our lives, to be worthy in your presence, to represent you. So bless again, dear Father, our participation in this exercise today as we do it fully in remembrance of you, in honor of you, in honor of the life that was shed, the blood that was shed for, on our behalf. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The Bible says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. God, our Creator, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose love pursues us our whole lives. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life to us in word and in deed, even unto death. Come, Holy Spirit, and feed us with your love that we may be filled with the power to love God with all of our hearts and our souls and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We want to invite you to come and partake of the Lord's Supper here at uh, the church building. Uh, we will be set up from 1 p.m. till 3 p.m. here. And so you can come and partake. Um, our 
deacons will be serving you. They will have food service gloves on. Everything has been prepackaged, and so uh, it is safe. We invite you to come and partake. Um, we ask that if you come and there is someone in the, uh, in the building at the time uh, receiving communion, that you just wait in your car until they are completed. And once they have left, then you may enter. God bless you. Hope to see you this afternoon.